welcome. Thank you, Andreas, and thank you for this opportunity that we had to start with Neuroflow. Neuroflow games, I have some points. I will talk about game art as practical neurophilosophy. We will show the Neuroflow game. We have the first play testing here. It embraces brainwave analysis and meditation as game mechanics. This game art piece is based on a series of performance works um, done with, or, um, with uh, historic consoles, arcades for, at the Computerspiele Museum. And now we also were implementing a new version with a neuro interface and a quote, let's say, of a meditation interface and a historic game console linked with the very new game interfaces of neurocontrollers. <laughs> we have our development set here and after a year it looks like that, but we have a newer one and you can test it afterwards in the game art exhibition here. Also after our panel, you can test it also with the new neuro interface and uh, see how we work with this input of data that we get in order to play through a game, but also to analyze ourselves. Um, this is a screenshot from a brain reading that I did in collaboration with Stefan Glasauer, who is next to me at the Ludwig Maximilians University, which is an fMRI scan of um, a magnet resonance imaging process of functional brain data. So functional, because I'm still alive, it's somehow functional, as you see. And this brain data is somehow used. This is a... Um, uh, a screenshot from a video work I was developing out of this uh, scan or brain scan data for a show in Hong Kong at the Connecting Spaces Gallery last year. Uh, and you see I come from both fields. I am also a um, teacher at the game design department in Zurich, but also a um, guest professor for artistic research at the v Applied Arts University in Vienna. So art research and game design. So the practical work and the research work fall together in the work that I do. So how do you get brain data? So with this stuff, but you see compared to professional equipment, this is what you see in the background. That was some research I did 2016 at the Neuro Conference in Paris at the Neurospin, Centre de Neuroimagerie Cerebrale par Résonance Magnétique Nucléaire. And this is a giant Tesla coil which produces a stable magnet resonance field of 14.2 Tesla. So this is the unit of um, the magnetic field. And with this, you analyze the brains of mice. <laughs> and then you get really good data, not even of humans with such big coils as you see in the background. Just to show you how relative this brain reading data is that we get in front of the Computerspiele Museum when I was communicating, and not only me, also other performers, with the Computerspiele um, exhibition artifact, the Space War console from 1971. So we were really playing with this historic machine and making an experiment with it. So. Uh, it was a part of thought control, so I can go back to see this image, this is 2017, and this image is 1964. So this is the first um, brainwave analysis and control tool of Edward Ewan, who was in 1964 developing this in uh, Boston, and he was able to switch on and switch off the light that you see on the left hand with his brain waves. Basically, it was with closing the eyes and opening it, because this gives a lot of information, what is measured in your eye. And that's how you can cheat with these brain devices, by the way, just a good tip. And the pros, like Stefan, they are calculating out the data they get from the eye analysis. But now I ask Thomas, with whom, who is uh, the artist who is responsible for the development of Neuroflow, the game, and we start it. It is a playthrough. You can play it on the console in the exhibition. And maybe we say a few words uh, 
why it looks as it looks, and you are about to start NeuroFlow. Thanks a lot. Yeah, welcome, also from my side. Um, yeah, as Margarete already mentioned, we have a kind of playthrough here, so we decided not to uh, present it live on stage, because the actual game kind of focuses on a meditative states, on hypnotic states, on a real, you know, uh, flow kind of state. You will hear about it later, what this flow kind of state maybe means. It also uh, needs this kind of attention from the user, so that you really focus on what you're doing, that you really hear what's uh, going on, that you kind of decipher what maybe you are inflicting and what is inflicted onto you. So we decided to use this kind of video presentation of one simple way to go through this play. I intentionally use the word play and not game for it. Mm. And you are in a black room. Do you choose the red pick or the blue couch? Think about it now. And if you all collectively think what you would choose before you were trained to imagine blue or red, that were the two screens that you have seen before. And this data is recorded, and now it recognizes I'm thinking about red, so the blue or the red bill, and now also this absurd big pink, <laughs> which was the idea of Thomas, of course, yeah, and disappearing. Just, just to be clear, this is one of uh, uh, certain po uh, possibilities how this game could work, how this play, and I did a mistake by myself now, uh, how this play would actually turn out to, uh, for you especially. So every time you start it, as an individual person, it would be different in some kind of way. Not only in the decisions that you make, or that you think that you are making, because maybe we will talk about how sure that you can be uh, what decision you already made or not made, but also uh, based on how fast this game will proceed and uh, how much it will slow down during the proceeding based on how you interact with it. It also, and this is not an, uh, yeah, it's, it is an artistic uh, decision, it's not a technical decision, it's actually a technical bug, but it of course runs a lot uh, faster on faster computers, so if you have a fast computer, it will really go really uh, fast, so you will not get everything that is happening there. So if you have a slower computer, and so is your brainwave, maybe a bit slower brainwave, slower means uh, lower hertz, that you will experience more. So if you have more time, if you have a slower computer that gives you this more time, you will have the possibility to experience more. Mm. Um, you also can play it with two, or three, two buttons, with the red or the blue button. And it also has an effect with the buttons. But it's just the game mechanics that is opposite of what you are doing normally. It's not about um, reacting quickly. Although yesterday there was an eSports master also playing the game and he fully concentrated and he said he will come back. He wanted to get into the flow. And that's what it's about, about the flow that you achieve in, in play and game situations. We have also an audio element which grows within the game that you, uh, we also used for, uh, are using for audio performances on stage. Yes, and that's what I mentioned, that the audio part, and I uh, intentionally used the word audio, from Latin I hear and not we hear, um, changes every time you play it based on uh, what, you, what the device measures from your brain. And it's also composed in a certain kind of way that it uh, inflicts with your normal perception of sound. So it's not about uh, that there are some musical structures that you kind of enjoy or not enjoy, but it uh, especially works with certain kind of frequencies and the combination of these frequencies to trigger certain uh, emotional states. Yeah. In theory, of course, yes. it's not all this is uh, based on audio is, is, is in theory. Of course, it would depend on the system, the PA system, if you use it with headphones or, or without, this also would kind of change how you would perceive it uh, in an audio kind of way. Mm -hmm. 
There are a lot of questions you are interrogated, but you only think red or blue, yes or no, basically. And it is also adapted to the device we are using, the simple consumer interface, which is somehow measuring and evaluating your data, but uh, in a very, let's say, particular or even limited way. And that's why you can play through this uh, game also with buttons, but mainly it is a feedback to the decisions that you make with the device that is analyzing inputs of flow states. And what I think is quite interesting, and that's why also Ste uh, Stefan is on this panel, is um, that we don't have to use this uh, device in the scientific kind of way. We can also use, you know, this big, uh, and I use this term aura now, this aura of this uh, device that you have a, a thing that looks like from a 80s science fiction movie that you put on and then you can especially measure what you're thinking. It's always called, uh, called something like thought control or mind control or, the, or I can read what you're thinking. Of course, we cannot do this and we don't uh. want to do this, but we want the people to have this kind of effect that they have something on the brain that, uh, yeah, says that it can read something. It, it does read something, but it, it's based on how you interpret this kind of data. This device don't, uh, say, uh, don't say, okay, you're in a good shape, you're in bad shape, whatever. It kind of gives us data that we could use scientifically, especially maybe not this device in particular, because this is more a consumer device than, for example, the devices uh, Stefan uses. But it's also uh, interesting based on its design, on its form. If you put this on, you have to put um, some liquid on it and then it kind of really squeezes your head, you're inside this device and then you start to play this game. So we find this quite interesting that it's also some kind of icon that you put on and then you're connected to some, si uh, some sort of machine, which is just a normal computer. Mm -hmm. Technically spoken, it is made with Unity. There is a class that also connects with the emotive interface and um, we will demonstrate how, how we, we were then also developing this concept where we were building on flow and on performance experiences. So the research of flow is a second order observation. It's about the self a look into your inside, but a research built on the personal. In artistic research, the, sub the subjective, the personal, is also relevant, usually. And here, very literally spoken, also the personal data. We create games as research in instrument into culture, society, future, and playful media. Yesterday, Franz Meria was on, on the stage here, and he was speaking on games and artistic research also. That's a quote from him from yesterday. I was thinking about that today and said we create games as research instruments, as artistic research method and as science tool. That's why we closely collaborate with scientists. And the concept of flow is an old psychological concept this US game designers might know. Flow was introduced by um, uh, Chik Mihal Csikszem Mihaly or Chik Mihal, Mihal Csikszem Mihal, a Hungarian uh, born uh, Ameri finally American or researcher who was also um, investigating happiness, how you achieve happiness when you get into a state of flow. And there is a whole tradition in game design also that implements these aspects of arousal, boredom, of worry, control, relaxation and anxiety to reach either apathy, which is boring maybe, but you get into meditation, sorry, <laughs> but also flow, where you really flow up, let's say, into a state of mind that is expanded and altered. But it is, uh, depending, it is relaxation and concentration. That's why these interfaces can also be used in order to 
uh, have an appearance that is more relevant or more present than in different states of mind or consciousness. This state of mind is now also measured with eye movement devices. That's why I was choosing this paper where with a newer device with brain movement analysis, also this awareness and concentration aspect or relaxation aspect is measured. It is often used also in um, different forms of marketing, etc., but also in neuroscientific analysis. And I was using together with Stefan, who is here on stage, one um, IC device that was developed by Stefan and his co colleagues from the LMU in Munich, and they also have a patent for it that is um, analyzing decision processes by triggering the eye movement. But what we were de doing here at this opera of entropy in, in Vienna, uh, 2016, that was our first appearance, is we are playing a computer game. And this is the test. The stimulus and test is a game we developed in order to make a decision. So that was a source inspired already by computer space and old console appearances where you are flying in space and also make a decision how to um, survive, basically. And that also was the case here, and also tested in different installations, like in Vienna at the Future of Demonstration Festival uh, in November 2017, where I made a big installation showing a self-test that I did in the International Space University, Strasbourg, 2017, in the Xi habitat, which is a sustainable habitat for extremist environments, which is used for the Mars mission. They are really uh, collaborating with ESA and NASA, and the European Space University is having this habitat as test set up. And inside this habitat, I was doing a duration performance, also playing this game, and also analyzing the brain data. That's how it looks, and how we, we are using this as a source for material, how I could analyze my own behavior, and then in the middle, playing this decision demo that you have seen on the other stage also. That was this game on the other stage the as well. So we have a narration over it as well, but I, I go further and jump further, just not to take too much time. Uh, we started the analysis of the impossibility of emptiness in the brain, which is connected to meditation with the Void Buxery in 2016. That's how I got to know Stefan. We were inviting him also to have his input assigned this at a role play that was in Vienna at the Kunstraum Goldscheider, a role play about analy brain analysis, and then also at the Cabaret Voltaire in Zurich um, 2016, where we presented a void book, an empty book, and also brains in order to introduce this research subject of brain analysis. And we were activating our research with a book, a playbook, that it was a toy also in all, that we tried to activate with a performance aspect. And then we jumped into the reality of the Computerspiele Museum. This is the Karl Marx Allee in front of it with this wonderful historic, um, I think, Bulgarian mosaic or, or Romanian, uh, I don't know, but the traditional motifs where we were introducing a tent, like an incubation tent for the old game console. And here we developed a LARP, a live action role play, in collaboration also with Harry Kopp, whom I see in the audience. Thank you very much. Also, he's a specialist on Nordic LARP, so a really experienced role player. And with him, we were sitting together and developing an experimental setup where he is also a neuroscientist, by the way. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that, but in your history you are, yes, which was a nice coincidence as well. And then setting up this performance, trying to analyze the console itself as a, let's say, a participant in the performance. It's not a device for us, it's not a tool. Here you see my input from the brain. I'm not controlling the environment as we do it now in this consumer version on the historic console. Also, this input was merged with the electromagnetic output of the machine. I have big up coils. You hear it? A little bit. I think you hear it. Um, yeah, as so a sort of um, interaction with the console as co-player 
starts and an expansion also of the connection and the interfaces, a historic telephone. So Herbie Kopp is using it in his role now, in role as scientist who is analyzing from outer space historic data. We developed a narration around the interface. So that was good fun, testing also then the scientist on stage at this uh, element here. We see some teasers of this performative environment. I don't know how it is with the audio, but it's the discourse, um, you as human and how much of your humanity remains, remains in interaction with this console. This was tested, let's say, in public space, in front of the museum. We were also dragging out the console uh, of the museum, which I say thank you very much again to Andreas in particular, but also to the whole institution, that they were that open in order to allow us to play with the console in a creative way. And that is another play with the console in the Rotes Rathaus Berlin in November, in November last year, I think. Uh, there was the occasion of the anniversary also of the Computerspiele Museum with a huge conference uh, on principles of game design, historic uh, game development, etc. And here we introduced also in this historic setup of the Rotes Rathaus a testing situation with people and participants there. And now you see she already is fully in the flow and hopefully controls the neurospace interface. Here are some elements of the performance again, testing other people who were coming and participating. Uh, this is the director of the media theatre of the Humboldt University who is quite interested what we are doing here with his data and with his analysis. And you see that these works are discourse, discursive pieces, discourse objects. It's not a game that you play per se. You can and you also experience something. But when you get into the staged situation, a discourse starts. You are somehow guided, what we learned also from the live action role play, let's say, from this life situation, you are guided into the experiment, into the consciousness that you, or the awareness that you heighten in when interacting with situations where you are measured, but you give input, where you play, and then you, by free will, let's say, you give data that you normally maybe don't give. Here we hear a bit more of this audio aspect. I don't know if you hear from the video the audio also. Yeah. Also 90%. Okay, I'm almost done. I, I don't know how. Uh, that's an important element. That's an important moment in the performance. You see he is stamped, filed, indexed, measured, and he got, gets the brain stamp from Herwig on his hand, and then the game goes on, and it is also a card game with a file that you get from your analysis, let's say. So that is always part for another process, another layer of artwork that happens when playing with these interfaces. You have more layers that you can that you that you can add. So I did some video art pieces with Samuel de Matra who was shooting on site and we developed some duration performance pieces with the incubation tent. I love also the tent that we have now outside and I'm really looking forward to this silver incubation tent that we have with the Ready for Dystopia show where I hope that we all go afterwards and have a look to it as well. I'm approaching the console with some macro micro performance where you are slowly approaching elements of the interface but you see it's a meditation around this object and then also a film, a movie is made out of it which could stand for itself from my point of view like a side effect of playing with games. Game art is not just making games, it's playing with games and with the game interface, hopefully. Yes, so here, you can watch that also online. We put it on the website and it's linked to the Computerspiele Museum website as well. 
And so we come to a conclusion. I said it's meditating with the console, getting into this interface, developing something new out of it. And here you see also the console meditating. So we have a complete series. I like this one when the sun comes in. It was standing there in the red, in the Rotes Rathaus Berlin again. And this is a very nice element when it awakes. It's even good in fast forward, I think. So thank you, Thomas, for this experience of collaborating, I would say. That's the handshake. I don't know if you see it, but it was when we, we were setting it up, always Klinkenstecker with the cables and making the console alive again. That was a very interesting and beautiful moment that we could experience and test over the last year. And now, I say meditating on the brain game at Area 7 Lab, and I introduce Stefan to give some neuroscientific background reflection about some work that you do as professional scientist, let's say. Um, please come. Of the LMU, wasn't Yes, so thank you. So thanks for being here. I give you really quick some kind of scientific presentation, and it's a real scientific presentation this time, so I'm not making jokes or anything. Yeah. So this is about what is a neuro interface. It's about control by thought, and I should also put a kind of question mark behind it. So what is neural control anyway? So when we interact with the environment, all we do is actually we control our muscles. We control our muscles by usually by neurons, by nerve cells, which are in the spinal cord, and those are controlled by neurons in the brain. So basically everything comes from the brain directly. So you see here, this is the part of the brain which basically controls your movements. It's the motor cortex over there. Yeah? And there are some other areas which you need for, do, for doing that. And then it goes to the muscle, the muscle fibers contract, you move. What is the idea of the neural interface? The neural interface is the idea we skip that whole muscle part. So why use muscles if I have a brain, right? Neural interface wants to skip the muscle part directly using brain activity to control something. Of course, that makes a problem. Yeah? The first problem is how do we get that brain activity? Yeah, it's, it's there, but we have to measure it. So one possibility would be we place a chip in your brain. Yeah, that's probably not what you exactly want. Yeah? I don't know when this sometimes shows up, sometimes doesn't. That's probably not exactly what you want, but it would be one possibility, and it's actually used in patients. Yeah? which cannot move their limbs, for example. Then you could pick up directly the neural signals in the brain, over there, some kind of decoding algorithm, and that's usually the hard part. Yeah? And then you could control, for example, an artificial limb, or your car, or a game, or whatever. Yeah? Sensory signals bring everything back to your brain, so you basically are now in a feedback loop with an artificial uh, limb, or whatever, so an effector, and you control it directly by your brain without using your muscles. The usual way to do that is nowadays to take EG systems, so it's one of the ways, and probably still the best way because it has the largest temporal resolution. That is how many signals we can pick up per time unit. Yeah? And that's really huge in, in EG systems. So up there is this emotive system. This is a pro professional system here which has many more electrodes, which has a much more tighter fitting, exact placement of the electrodes and all that stuff. And you can see that the electrodes are all over the place, not just like in the emotive, basically on the forehead. And I think emotive uses not only brain signals, but all kinds of signals, for example, signals from facial muscles, signals from the eyes, all those generate so if you move your muscles, that generates electrical signals. So you can measure movement of your muscles by measuring electrical signals. So you can afterwards, if you want to try this game, try to control it by something else, not just by your thought. Try to make movements, eye movements or whatever. Yeah? Try to figure out how this works. Yeah? Try to kind of hack it. So. How does it work if we really pick up neural signals? Neural signals are there because in our brain, the neurons in the brain, the nerve cells, they communicate on one hand chemically, but on the other hand also electrically. 
And those electric activity we can pick up. We can pick it up not from a single neuron, of course, because a single neuron has such a small signal that you can't, you never be able to pick it up from the outside. So what we rely on is that lots of neurons in your brain do approximately the same thing at the same time. So we get a very rough signal on the, on the surface. Yeah? So this is here a measurement of really one neuron. So you see the spikes here. These are these action potentials, firing of the, of the thing. This is a, what is called a local feed potential. And this is the local feed potential on the surface of the cortex. This is not at the scalp. Yeah? It's the surface of the cortex, very close. And then if you, if you go here, so you can see here, this would be the local feed potential. Then we go up to the scalp, and there's almost nothing left. Yeah? So this is the hard part. Yeah? We have almost nothing left when we put the electrodes on your head. But we can't go inside. Yeah? Nevertheless, um, we try to do that, we try to pick up signals, and usually in a neurofeedback system, in a professional one, this is from another scientific paper, I'm taking pictures from scientific papers, um, it's usually mentioned up down there, so it is a really new one, you can see that the whole chain of processing which is necessary is really complicated, yeah? You pick up all those signals, you make all kinds of filters there, methods to extract the signals, to classify the signals, and in the end you will end up basically, even in professional systems which are used for, for example, in patients who cannot talk anymore, locked in patients, you will basically be able to pick up a signal which says yes or no. Yeah, that, that's all. And you are really happy if you can do that. Yeah? So that's basically what you get no way of reading thoughts or anything. Yes and no, that's all you get, yeah? even in the professional systems. Another possibility, so one of the possibilities of getting this yes and no are the brain waves. So this is a raw EEG signal, um, which you get usually, but you can analyze it with respect to how many of these up and down oscillations you get by time unit, that's frequency, and then you have this kind of different brain waves, and they tell you something about what the state of your brain actually is. Brain waves come in different flavors, as you can see, and they have a kind of a different meaning depending on what they are. And you can, in a certain way, manipulate them by concentrating, for example. Yeah? You concentrate on something, you get sleepy, yeah? You, your brain waves change, you do something else, you get angry, your brain waves change, etc., etc. So that's basically the basis for it. And that's also the basis for what, here, what is used here. Yeah? And what is used here is basically based on things like resting state, meditation, things like that. And this is, for example, from a study, from a very recent study. Um, they were looking at EEG signals in resting state, eyes closed. So you just close your eyes and let your mind wander. And on the other hand, you have a meditation, a focused attention meditation. You focus on something, for example, on your breathing. Yeah? You know, that kind of stuff, breathe, uh, om, 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 etc. And so on. So you, you try to concentrate that. Yeah? And then you get different brain patterns. So what this study, for example, found that it doesn't change only in one frequency band. It changes all over the brain in every frequency band you get a kind of a different, totally different, they call this long-range temporal correlations. These change if you do meditation. Yeah? And this is one of the bases of what, what this kind of stuff here picks up and wants to show you. Yeah? You, want, they, you, should, you should try to change your brain activity, but on the other hand, also you can test whether it's really that, what the, what the apparatus picks up. And my last slide shows brain activity, but this brain activity was not um, taken up by an apparatus like this. This was done in an fMRI scanner, and it's actually Margarete's brain, which you can see there. It's working. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'm really happy that my brain is still working, definitely so. We are almost there, I would say. Darstellung. Warte mal, jetzt muss ich das noch. Ja. Sagst du noch was dazu? Ja. And this is our final um, 
goodie that we pr prepared for you. Just Thanks. two minutes, then you can go. Yes, <laughs> because we <laughs> just were thinking about how we can kind of uh, open up this process of uh, what we're doing. And I think you kind of figured that we're doing uh, this project from a very, very uh, different kind of point of, of views and also uh, interests. And we're not really uh, based on the fact that we want to do a solid scientific kind of thing. So we want to use uh, all the kind of data, all this kind of information, all this kind of signals and retransform it and put it in a, a pot and stir it and maybe something comes out, maybe nothing comes out, that's also totally fine. But we want this kind of uh, activation of the brain in any kind of way. That's why we decided we also want to open up this process and doing a video of it, kind of a developing process. It's not a really a developing process. It's just me clicking through the uh, different uh, pictures and videos and application that we did on the way. And we kind of compiled it for you. And it's about three minutes and a half. And then, it's, then you're done. Thank you. Thank you. So this is our making of video detect table.
Thank you. Um, oh, I'm curious, how does the flow state the player can achieve in like this first game you showed us uh, compared to the flow state um, players uh, um, can achieve in games like League of Legends or um, any game that gives you simple repetitive tasks? Yeah. How do, how repetitive do tasks are part of every meditative practice, yeah. practice as well. Yeah. So it is the same. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> I, I thought it was a redundant I'm question. I'm not evaluating. I'm, yeah. That's why I was mentioning the esports player who was really, I have to say, one of the few persons who really enjoyed it yesterday already. <laughs> and because he got into the flow, and it is, uh, of course, a performance and meditation piece that is making exactly triggering questions as you are posing it now. Mm. Think, hey, what I'm doing? I'm, I'm doing, um, you can call it meditation. Yeah. Sounds interesting, thank you. And uh, let me add that I really like the red yeah. African woman. The real cool. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. So, yeah. Thank you as well. Uh, so you have to adjust uh, your like, sensors uh, for every individual human separately, right? I mean, whenever you receive... Like uh, whenever you try to interpret a new kind of signal, like uh, yes or no, or blue or red, you have to kind of adjust it for everybody individually, right? Okay. So, in fact, uh, is it uh, like similar after you kind of uh, recognize what kind of signal you receive from this particular human for this kind of uh, feeling or thought? Uh, is it kind of similar after that all the time? Like uh, whenever you think yes, basically, you get the same kind of signal? We are doing training sessions with every player. That's why we are just doing guided tours right after this session and tomorrow at 1 p.m. or 4, let's say. And answer it, please, also about the signals and maybe even Stefan says a few words how signals can be comparable or the same from different individuals. We are all very similar in general, unfortunately, maybe, but yeah. But I think what you were referring to, if I would train you, because it's some sort of training, to concentrate on one color and on the other color and if you do it again if it would be the same outcome no it's not because you cannot uh, concentrate with this device or we cannot measure the concentration on this device exactly and you cannot keep a thought for a, a period of, of time so it, you will kind of uh, yeah, derange from your way and go different kind of ways while you are uh, asked to think about it. So there's a there's there's uh, one especially one big uh, time frame where we measure your uh, concentration over time. So in this time, you will most likely vary uh, between different kind of states and we will read out uh, which way you prefer so how much you were thinking on one side of this kind of thing but it will not definitely be the same if you do it again Maybe yeah? well thank you and last question so how accurate are your predictions by now like uh, what's percentage of like true uh, recognitions of uh, whatever data a user is sending. You mean if we ask the, the, the audience, uh, did you think about blue? And we and, and we check. We did. We do never ask the audience what they think because we're not interested what the uh, person itself wants to have. We just measure what the brain gives us and how this consumer interface interprets this kind of data. So we're kind of uh, getting rid of the. Uh, ra rational uh, a person that is playing the game and just using the brain data and what uh, this device does with it. So if you want to think on, for example, blue, we actually do not care if you want to think about blue. We just read out what you think. Yeah, because if, if you always say, think, I don't like blue, it's the same info, it's not. But I remember some brain reading experiments also from uh, different um, other institutes. So how comparable is data that you get even from professional sets? So f what, what you do uh, very often in professional brain computer interfaces is you don't take this frontal activity, but you, you take, uh, for example, motor activity. Motor cortex is about here. And when you imagine, for example, when I, Im when I move my hand you know, like this, then my motor cortex gives activity. 
And if I imagine that I move my hand, then this motor cortex also gives activity. And this is relatively the same in different persons. So it's, it's for example, this motor imagery is some way to pick up signals from different persons. Yeah? And this is, so basically it's, the question is then, imagine now you move your left hand or imagine now you move your right hand and this would be the yes, no decision. And these decisions can be picked up very accurately actually. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yep. Thank you.